This grand experiment, the United States of America, was on the brink of complete and desperate failure in that summer of 1863. The 170,000 men who met at Gettysburg in 90 degree July heat were fighting for their separate visions of the future. These visions would collide in the bloodiest three days ever in American history. Three days that would define a nation. By the summer of 1863, the Confederate States of America and the United States of America had been at war for over two grueling years. The Army of Potomac had been through some dreadful experiences. You remember they'd had six commanders by then uh, and been whipped pretty badly often, had never really won. Both armies were battle-weary, but the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia seemed to be gaining the upper hand over the Federal Army of the Potomac, thanks in large measure to its brilliant and charismatic leader, Robert E. Lee. Hooker's been replaced. George Meade's the new commander. Harrison read it in the Yankee papers. George Meade, Pennsylvania man. Meade would be cautious, I think. Take him some time to get organized. Perhaps we should move more swiftly. There may be an opportunity here. Yes, sir. He was able to snatch victory from the jaws of defeat time and time again in the face of overwhelming uh, numbers on the Union side, and to do it with a kind of dramatic flourish that made him legend not only in the South, but in the North as well. Well, I understand that he was a very gentle man and a deeply spiritual man, but he had about 70,000 men at his command in the Army of Northern Virginia, and he committed uh, a great many of them uh, into battle, and most of them lost their lives. So all this had a profound effect on him. Duty to him was the highest commitment that a human being could uh, make, and uh, you could do no more than that, and you should not do any less, was his motto. General James Longstreet was Lee's second-in-command, the officer he trusted and respected most. First and foremost, he is a soldier. Now, I mean, you know, professional life for soldier. He was uh, 40 years old, a major in the U.S. Army when this all started. He also was, uh, had been involved as a quartermaster, ordnance, infantry, cavalry, staff officer. He'd done about everything, and he knew enough about artillery. And he, he was extremely scientific about it. Meade's closing fast. It could be he's thinking of uh, swinging around behind us. Behind, in front, the direction does not matter. We will fight him wherever he is. Probably got old Abe Lincoln on his back, trying to throw us out of Pennsylvania. We may have an opportunity here. I agree. Our objective was to get their army out of Virginia into the open. Now, they are in the open. I maintain Longstreet is about as southern as you can get, but he doesn't conform to the romantic view of a southerner. Uh, he's a, uh, he was slightly deaf, which made him appear somewhat stolid at times. His wife and children died of fever early in the war. He remarried, but uh, he had that terrible loss. As I say, Longstreet to me is completely admirable as a soldier. He knew what could be done, he knew what could not be done. General Hill wishes to inform you that he is going to Gettysburg this morning with his lead division, General Heath. For what purpose? He advises me that there is a supply of shoes in the town, and he intends to requisition some footgear. General Hill knows I want no fight till this army is concentrated. General Hill expects no opposition except for some local militia with shotguns and such. Very well. Though the town of Gettysburg had no strategic significance, it was a convenient source of supplies for Lee's advancing army. Lee, unaware that the Federal Army was on a parallel course with his Confederates north towards Gettysburg, approved an expedition into the town. This led to an unexpected encounter with Federal General John Buford's lone cavalry advance. At war, there are many things are accidents. Napoleon said when two, two groups of men get lined up opposing each other, a dogfight can start a battle. You know what's gonna happen here in the morning? Sir. Damn rebel army's gonna be here. They'll move through this town, occupy these hills on the other side, and our people get here, Lee will have the high ground. They'll be the devil to pay. The high ground. I think one of the, the the things that really intrigued me about playing this character was that Buford, as I'm told and as I've read, was 
was and still is considered kind of one of the unsung heroes of the Civil War. He, in fact, picked this ground that they fought this battle on. The Army of the Potomac had one great advantage. Uh, they were fighting on their home ground, an advantage the Southerners had had through most of the war leading up to that. Uh, one Confederate said, I believe the damn Yankees shoot straighter in the North than they do when they're down south. After the fierce fighting of the first day, July 1st, both armies knew, like it or not, that a significant confrontation would take place at Gettysburg. What are you thinking, General? Maybe we should not have fought here. I know that, but we have prevailed. The men have prevailed. Yes, sir, they have always done that, but in the morning, we may be outnumbered and they'll be entrenched on the high ground. General, you know as well as I, we have never concerned ourselves with being outnumbered. That is true, sir, you are right. But if we move south to Washington, they have to pursue us and then we can fight on ground of our choosing. But the enemy is here. We did not want the fight, but the fight is here. How can I ask this army to retreat in the face of what they have done this day? While the Confederates drove the Federals out of town, Lee's Second Corps commander, General Richard Ewell, made a tactical error that would soon prove fatal. His forces failed to take the high ground beyond Gettysburg, much to Lee's and General Isaac Tremble's frustration. We could have taken that hill. God in his wisdom knows we should have taken it. There was no one there, no one there at all, and it commanded the town. We could have done it, sir. A blind man should have seen it. Now they're working up there. You can hear the axes of the federal troops. And so in the morning, many a good boy will die taking that hill. The American Civil War was in many ways the first modern war. Unfortunately for the average infantryman, advances in weaponry far outpaced advances in the tactical use of the foot soldier. The reason for the large casualties in Civil War battles is that the weapons were ahead of the tactics. Uh, the, the rifle musket uh, had an effective range of a couple of hundred yards, very effective range. But when they got these new weapons, they kept the old tactics. And the worst thing they did was they believed that to mash your fire against an opponent, you had to mash your men. So you advanced shoulder to shoulder across an open field against this deadly fire. The people had heart, and you just don't realize it until you get out on the field and actually participate, wheel one of these guns around, and then figure they had to load and unload these things by hand, put them over stone walls, over fences. And, and then after you shoot one, and have actually shot one live, you can imagine the people walking into them and not running. I, I'm just walking into a gun knowing what it's going to do to you. This is a 12-pound Napoleon. It's a solid bronze gun. It shoots uh, with two and a half pounds of powder at a 10-degree elevation. It'll shoot a mile and a half. This was a favorite gun of the Confederacy. General Lee liked these guns better than anything. This is a smooth bore. If you notice, the bore is smooth. It's not rifled. It shoots a round ball. That way you have several different types of balls you can shoot. You can shoot a solid shot, you can shoot an exploding ball that'll explode over troops, or you can shoot a canister, which basically looks like a tomato can full of balls. It works like a giant shotgun, which was, it was devastating on troops. While the artillery reenactors lent their historical expertise to the making of Gettysburg, special effects coordinator Matt Vogel and his team contributed their own style of fireworks. When I sit back and design where the bombs are going within the frame, I'm looking at the colors of the bombs, where they're crossing. It's just to create more of a chaotic movement or behind the men who are doing their own chaotic movement because uh, the Battle of Gettysburg really calls for it to fill the frame up with a lot of action. So the, the effects and the stunts are always the icing on the cake. Adding to the chaos on one particular day of filming, an extraordinary 40 artillery crews gave of their time and skills. A full battalion firing um, is something maybe a couple times in a lifetime you may actually get to go and see something like that. And we experienced it four times this afternoon. To have this many guns all go off at once, so that was outstanding. And you know the emotion and the troops coming through and getting involved, it was exciting. Well, you know, it's not every day you get to see thousands.